over the years, I collected on and off. Uh, my interest level was right down there, only because I had two sons and I wanted them to get interested in coin collecting. So while they were growing up, we were going to coin shows, we were doing a lot of things. Then, of course, they grew up, they got married, and I cried for both of them because I was happy they were gone. <laughs> and my wife cried because she was going to miss them. So I immediately went upstairs, took over the big bedroom into an office, and that's where I operated. But I've been retired now for about 11 years, and it wasn't until about 2006 where we took a, a trip to, uh, to the Colonial Williamsburg, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful spot to, to be in. If I could learn how to use this. We got there, and for some reason, it was like a transition. I felt like I was back in the 18th century. They had working farms. They had people who were you know, reenactors, but they were there full time. They were real professionals. They would, they would demonstrate how things were done in the 18th century. Uh, the stores that we would walk into, they were, they were basically walking back into 1712. They had to sell all these little foreign coins. Hey, come on in. They had all these foreign coins. And I said, what these foreign coins? Well, it's one of my I saw a ledger that was uh, roped off. I couldn't get to so hold and see it. And sure enough, I saw the entries were done in pounds and, and shillings and pence. So I said, my goodness, this is this doesn't make too much sense. Where's where's the American coinage? Well, in, in 1793 is when the United States Mint first started minting coins. And they started minting coins in 1793. They were the half cent and the full cent. So, and they didn't do too well either. There weren't too many, many coins minted. As a matter of fact, I took a look at all the coins minted from 1793 to 1800, and there wasn't enough coinage to give a coin per person. There were like 5 million people, estimated the uh, uh, number of folks that lived in all the colonies. And there was like maybe two or three million dollars worth of coins. So the next very important day to remember is 15, 1857. That was the year that the government said all foreign coins were no longer available to be in circulation. Take them out. You've got two years to trade them all in for American coins. So you had like you know 60 plus years between the mint of our first coinage to the mint saying, the, the government saying, we can do it now with only U.S. coins. So now you've had, over all these years, really going back to 1640, you've had foreign coins and American coins starting in 1793 that were circulating together in tandem. You know, I'm scratching my head and I'm saying, all these coins, because at Colonial Williamsburg, they showed us the, the, the coins that were excavated in all of these sites that they were, they were uh, doing these archaeological digs. And they had coins from Germany. They had coins from France and Britain, uh, Great Britain. Uh, the Spanish coins were, were the most number of coins that they, they excavated. So now I'm saying to myself, they, they have all these coins. They're all circulating. How could they value these coins? How could commerce be conducted with all of these foreign coins. Well, first book I bought, the first of so many, and I have a bibliography for you in case you want on the way home. Uh, it was the first book that I purchased, The Coins of Colonial America. And in that book, they, they showed basically the various coins that merchants would, def would, would basically use for, for commerce. They had basically the, the Spanish uh, silver dollar, or the, the Spanish mill dollar, as they called it, they would literally cut these coins up so that they could make change. They could, and that, and yeah, I, I have some samples to show you that are copies. Uh, I said, gee, that's interesting. It's like going to a store with a, 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 a silver dollar that was minted, you know, in, let's say, 1963 and cutting it in half so I could buy something for 25 cents. <laughs> and, but but they, had, they did what they had to do. That was the key of the thing. And here they have a list of all the coins 
coins, and I'll, you can all see this, by the way. After we're finished, we have all kinds of books with all the coins that I've collected that have circulated during this time period, so you can take a look at them. And I'm looking at all of these coins, and I'm reading this book, and I'm seeing 1857, I'm seeing all these coins that are trading in, in that time period, and I'm saying, I'm turned on to this. This, this to me is interesting. This to me has, be, has literally become my passion, is to read constantly on how the, our forefathers managed to make this country so great and how they did it through the economy and coinage. And my wife said, you're not passionate, you're obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess she's right, you know, to a very great degree. I mean, I would, I would much rather read a book about uh, Thomas Hancock and the, the great businessman in Boston and what he did to, to make things work than to watch anything that TV has to offer. And, and, uh, and that's good. I, I read a lot and I have a lot of headaches. And I go to bed, but I go right to sleep. And then I wake up 4 o'clock in the morning and I say, I wonder what that was about. You know? <laughs> but anyway, so... So uh, having, having gone through all that, um, I came back uh, and, I, and I went to the library and I got a second book out of the library and I read it once, <coughs> cover to cover, and this is American Foreign Coins, uh, Foreign Coins with Legal Tender Status in the United States from 1793 to 1857. Mm -hmm. And I read through it once and I have to tell you, I, maybe I understood a third of it. And I read it again. And maybe now I understand 34% of it. <laughs> so I said, let me go to the bibliography and let me see what other books have to offer. So after a uh, number, I, I can't tell you how many books I have, but they all have a special meaning to me. So when I do research, I go right to a book I know has information on that. And now I read this book and I really enjoy it because I understand what it's saying. And it's very hard to do that uh, unless you really make a study of it. So then, I, then, I, then my wife told me that uh, she read in the, uh, the Star that the Long Island collection, the Penny Packet collection, was in the, our library, in my own backyard. I said, you're kidding me. What, tell me one more. She said, they have all of these original documents that date all the way back to, to the purchase of all of the patents of South Hampton, East Hampton, uh, and I said, great. And I came in and I met Gina, I met Steve, and I have to tell you, I've been bothering them ever since. <laughs> I mean, I, as I was, uh, by the way, at the same time, I was collecting uh, foreign coins that circulated uh, during this time frame. And, and we'll, I'll show them to you all as we go through them, and after we're finished in our discussion, come on up uh, and look at them. And they were extremely helpful, extremely helpful. And I just want to move a little bit to talk a little bit about what I discovered early, early on. And if you didn't quite understand what I was looking at, in, in the colonies, if it was an English colony, they, they looked at everything in, in so far as pounds, shillings, and this is how they, they valued everything. Uh, one pound, by the way, this to me again was another, another language I had to learn. I had to learn how to convert all of these English uh, coins so they made sense to me. I'd go through ledgers and I would add up all of the ledger accounts in pounds, shillings, and pence to see if, if my number was the same as their number. And a lot of times I found arithmetical mistakes. And I didn't know whether or not these accounts were for uh, credit or debit. Now, I'm no accountant, okay? I'm not a numismatist. I'm just a person who likes to have a hobby. And this hobby takes up a lot of my time now between doctor appointments and maybe <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I said, my goodness. So, now I know that, that uh, a pound is 20 shillings, a shilling is 12 pence, and one pound equals 240 pence. Oh, that was something good to start with. So now all of the English colonies basically used, and I'm sorry if I'm not the way, that did that. Now, when you get to Dutch colonies, I don't know if this has to do with here. Uh, here we go. The 
Dutch colonies used Gilders, Stevens, and Dukes. These were Dutch coins, which I have here, and I'll show you in a moment. Uh, these coins uh, were basically used in all Dutch colonies. There was, a, there was a colony in Poughkeepsie that were first colonized by uh, Huguenots. Uh, they were farmers. They, they, they grew a lot of wheat. Uh, the merchants in, in that area, in New Falls, it was, uh, in Poughkeepsie, that whole area, uh, they, they would use for the local people, they would use gilders, steamers, and dukes. And the same merchant, when he would sell wheat to the merchants down in New Amsterdam or New York, would use pounds, shillings, and pence. So the man was running two sets of books, one in gilders, one in, Ch in English, one in Dutch. And in those days, they basically didn't have to worry about the profit line because they didn't even keep inventory. It was like one, one entry, it wasn't double entry, it was single entry in county. And the reason why I know this is because I bought a book called The History of the County. So if you want to go to sleep at night and have trouble, <laughs> <laughs> you can just take us and read a chapter. But I bought it for one reason. There was one chapter in there on colonial accounting. So what they found was, and it was, it, it was printed in, in England, it, it, it was basically, uh, I think, uh, 1929 was the last edition, so I had trouble finding this book. Amazon has everything. But anyway, I got this, and they said there were problems with a lot of these ledgers. They, number one, you didn't know if they were crediting or debiting, and there were a lot of arithmetical mistakes. Well, all of a sudden, I felt good, because I was covering all these mistakes, and I thought it was me. Well, it was the merchant himself. So that was a, a, a side story about the, the uh, Dutch colonies. French colonies, they basically used their own system of lifas uh, and souls and uh, deniers. They basically had the same values as the British uh, uh, nomenclature because what they, what they basically did is they traded quite a bit uh, back in the, the 15th, 16th century in Europe and they, and they styled their, their currency nomenclature that were the same, basically. And the English, by the way, uh, the pound, there's no such thing as a pound in those days. There, there was no pound coin or a pound dollar. It just designated 240 pence. Because if you took the silver penny, which was the pence, which I have a copy here, and you added them up, it took 240 of these pennies to make a pound. So that's where the pound came from, by holding a pound's worth of silver pennies, which I found fascinating. And as, you, as you go through these little historic readings, it's just amazing to see, in, in effect, uh, how a lot of these things came about. This is one of, this is one of the legends and this is one of the legends you'll find up here. This is done by, um, I, forget, I forget which one, which one was it? This was a, a Isaac Van Scoy uh, ledger account. These were 1832 now, we're in 1832, and you see it's still in pounds and, and, and shillings and pence, 1832. I mean, we've been, we've been producing, we've been producing uh, our own coins since 1793, and in 1832, they're still entering pounds and shillings and pence, which is, I couldn't understand why. Because it took until 1857 to get everything straightened out, that's why. And now you have, uh, I think you have, what you have with all these merchants, they would run the journal every day. Every day they would enter everything that they sold, everything that they bought and by the names of the people that owed them money and who they owed money to. And then at the end of the day, they would just enter the names and who was what. So that's why we don't see what did that four shillings, eight, eight uh, pence uh, buy. I mean, what was that all about? Well, we don't know unless we had the journal. But here was so very interesting too. You see, look at these names, Maltford, Osborne, Ann, Mother Maltford, uh, Van Scoy, these are all names that go back to the, the founding of East Hampton. Yes, sir. 
Where, where did you get this? Uh, is this from this collection? This is from the collection. Yeah. Yes, exactly. All all of the all of the account books are from the collection. So that that's uh, that's. Are those the, uh, the signatures? Because the handwriting is different. Uh, the handwriting. These these the, the merchant actually made this listing. Right, but you think he had the customer sign? No. In those days, the trust that they had, everybody, everybody, especially when they read the basically that 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 meant that this individual also came and I'm sure he did more shit with his pen, and then he'll pay me. But you know, sometimes these accounts were open for a year or even two years before everything was paid back and forth. So it's really. Now this 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 particular ledger, I just wanted to show you uh, what it what year is this? This is 1756, 1757. Now this particular ledger, you'll see. I wish I had the point. Uh, this one is uh, Aaron Isaac's debtor for carting from Sag Harbor three quarters of a load. A load of what? <laughs> oh no! In those days, there were a lot of loads of manure by the way, that would come off of freights and go out to the farmers, and they would they would cart this stuff all over the, all mm -hmm. over Long, all over Sag Harbor and, and East Hampton. Uh, here's one debtor that was charged one shilling six pence for a barrel. Uh, where is there's another one? Load, load of firewood, four shillings, six pence. What would that be in today's price? Uh, shillings then in New York were worth about 12 and a half cents. Uh. 12 and a half cents per, sh per shilling. So if you could do the arithmetic. On some, on some of these, by the way, I have, I have annotated prices so you can see them. Uh, there's also one here. Okay, this one has got a bushel and a half of wheat. Seven shillings, six pence. That basically is showing me now this this dealer was, was working with commodity money, which we'll cover real quickly. Commodity money, you'll see locally, all of the, the uh, local governments will print a legal list of all the commodities and what the values would be. And they use that as money. So when you see entries here, it could be money. But in all instances, it's basically a commodity. There, there was one uh, item here. Okay, oh, I get nervous when I have it. <laughs> uh, here's one killing one beast, uh, one shilling. <laughs> now, in the records, the, the, the East Hampton uh, uh, town records, it, it's it, it's all over. It's filled all over. They even get four shillings for killing a wild animal. And in those days, they're basically wildcats. Wildcats. Uh, 1729 was the last time I think that the last of the wolves were shot and killed in this area. So, but the the town would actually pay. The government would pay four shillings, and they had to bring in either the head or the paws. And it, it was. I mean, what else would you bring? In? Yeah. You know. Okay, let's go. On. Wait, each one has an X. Is that? That's when they're paid. I when see. that individual pays, they usually. Exit out, and, and they'll uh, sometimes they'll, they'll exit the whole. If there's just like four or five entries for one person, they exit the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I don't want to get too far from here because I'm afraid I won't put you to sleep. Uh, okay, Dutch coins. Let's cover the Dutch coins first, because the Dutch basically uh, they 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 were probably the best seamen navigators uh, at that point in time in history. Uh, they had at one time at the, at the, at the, the height of trade uh, 16,000 ships, cargo ships, 160,000 seamen. Uh, they were all over the world. They were in, the, in the, the, the eastern countries in the Mediterranean, they were in the Orient, they were, they were in Asia. Uh, they had a very big uh, stake in the sugar trade in the West Indies. They became wealthy on, on that. Uh, they needed to get more people to to work the farms, the uh, sugar, excuse me, plantations. 
So they went into the slave trade. So they went to Africa, got slaves, brought them to the West Indies, and worked on the plantation. Uh, and that's that's basically uh, that particular story, which is in the which is a good story. But you found a lot of that going on in those days. Uh, uh, even the people, the folks up in uh, Boston, when they started the, their their cargo ships, they, they had a lot of them. Uh, they would go to the West Indies. They would pick up sugar and molasses. They would make rum, take the rum, go to Africa, get the slaves, and dry it with rum. Bring the slaves back down to the West Indies, pick up some more molasses and rum, and they'd have that cycle going. Uh, and usually. No money traded hands. It was all barter and accounts of all these, of these uh, uh, trades. Now, and you'll see this later as you come up. This is a, a ducatone. Uh, these are basically trade dollars. The ducatone was worth uh, about a dollar twenty in those days. Uh, it was a large coin. It was a beautiful coin. I look at these coins as, as art. That was a big trade dollar. The lion dollar was another very giant trade dollar. Uh, the, the lion dollar tr was circulated quite a bit in the New York area because the Dutch had, uh, and New Amsterdam, they had Fort Orange, which is Albany. That was the big trading post. Uh, they had uh, Connecticut, parts of Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland. So they looked like in that whole sea, sea shore area. Uh, the lion dollar, was really the, the, the trade dollar uh, more so than the Ducatone. The Ducatone also circulated in the United States. Any trade dollar came to the United States because of the trade with the West Indies, etc. Now, the, 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 the Lion dollar and the Ducatone, all of these coins were trade dollars and accepted everywhere because their weight and the amount of silver was consistent with every coin. And once you have the consistency of every coin, you could go anywhere and they'd be accepted. The, uh, they were very big also in the Levant, which is uh, the, the western region of the Mediterranean, eastern region rather, uh, big, big business with uh, a lot of the Muslim countries. Uh, the, the, the Maria Theresa uh, coin, which I am sorry you can't see this up front, but the Maria Theresa coin was an Austrian coin. And that coin was well accepted in all Muslim uh, 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 countries. Because, and if you, if you can see it, when you come up here, and I have a magnifying glass, they put a veil on Maria Theresa's head. <laughs> and it was accepted <coughs> by all Muslim countries. Okay. Which, which is real interesting. <coughs> nothing changes in history, folks. The more you read, the more you realize that nothing is new. You know? And that's it's, it's really exciting. Now, you, I also have here uh, a two stever. This is a do it, a do it, and a one stever. These are these are like farthings. Now farthings. Remember the chart I had in pounds, shillings, uh, pence. Well, farthings is the next lower level. You got four farthings and one pence. So sometimes you see one and a half pence. That's one pence, two farthings. So you have to start thinking like the British. You have to really. We had a little bit of this stuff. You really you probably haven't at your fingertips because of all the reading I do. I, don't, I can't go to a calculator and plug. The, the French coins, you know, the French basically Louisiana, Canada, uh, Montreal, Quebec, that's really where they really were. Uh, they, they had really one major trade coin, and that was the EQ, ECU. The EQ uh, was valued about the same as the lion dollar, uh, which was about five shillings. EQ was, was traded, uh, circulated quite heavily, especially in the New York region, the New York area, uh, because they were very, they, they were uh, uh, a lot of trading done. They, 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 they picked this up, but Maryland also was like the major silver coin. Uh, so the, the French, once they got here in, in, into the colonies, uh, they basically had. Uh, this is a 12 denier. This is a this is a, uh, a copper coin. You can't see it so well, but uh, that particular coin uh, was uh, the only copper coin that that France sent over to them. And they looked at it and they went, 
Frenzy Pack. I don't know. That. <laughs> and, and what they wanted, basically, they were here for beaver pelts. That's what they were here for. And they were trading more than the natives, the local natives, didn't want money. They, they, wanted, they wanted pieces, shot and powder, pieces in Dutch is firearms. So when you have a piece, you know, in the old movies, and you had a piece, that was the Dutch uh, 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 nomenclature for, for a gun. Uh, so they got, the, they got what they wanted, powder, uh, gunpowder and, and shot, and basically turned over the beaver pelts. Uh, this is a coin, it's a copper coin, you see it, it's stamped RF on it, boom, hammer stamp, and that was for the, 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 uh, the Republique Francais, which basically was the, uh, the coins that were accepted only in the West Indies. They were not accepted in the United States or, or, or their, their colonies were French. So that was a very successful coin. Was there any counterfeiting back then? I'm sorry? Was there any counterfeiting? Uh, there was more counterfeiting than you can imagine. <laughs> yes, there was. Uh, and a lot of the counterfeiting came a little bit later on, especially when, when uh, the, the colonies imported a lot of the half pennies, copper half pennies. A lot of them were, in fact, counterfeits. And that caused a copper panic much later on than this particular period. You had a lot of counterfeiting going on, especially when, when we were in the uh, revolution. A lot of the continental dollars that were, were printed by the central government and by the states. Uh, in New York Harbor, there were ships from Britain that were printing out millions and millions of dollars worth of dollars, counterfeit continental dollars. So you had 200 billion continental dollars coming from the central government. You had 200 billion dollars coming from the various colonies because they could print the money themselves. They were like sovereign nations at that point in time. And you had all these millions and billions coming from the ships in New York Harbor. <laughs> and of course, the valuation of the continental dollar, you heard it was worth the continental. It was worth nothing and by the time the revolution was over. And that's another whole section we've got to cover some day. But, but that, that's a good question because was Ben Bernanke printing continentals at that time? Uh, ben Bernanke, uh, I, I think it was one of his relatives.
British would deliver the goods, you know, they would buy the goods, and now they have to ship all the coins back to Britain. And in Britain, uh, they were having their trouble with silver. Uh, it so happens that uh, it was Bernie, one of Bernie Madoff's great great goods. <laughs> changing organizations. <laughs> well, they would take, even though they weren't allowed to ship uh, British silver coins, they could ship the foreign silver coins and bullion wherever they wanted to. And, everybody's, and I'm sure that they never, I never, they never figured that out, the, the government. So what they did was, because Europe was getting something like seven pence more per ounce of silver, the dealers were taking their foreign silver coins and bullion, shipping it over to Europe, selling it for gold, which was undervalued compared to Britain. They bring the gold back and sell the gold on the open market, and they make a fortune. But what happened was Britain didn't have any silver. And from like 1761 to 1815, they minted almost zero mint coins. I mean, they were in trouble more than I think the colonists were. That's why they kept draining everything off. So, uh, where am I? I guess I'm, I'm still in Britain. Uh, so basically, that, that's the story on, on mercantilism. Uh, they, we, we were not allowed to, and I say we, because we are the colonists, we are descendants. Uh, number one, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't print money, and they couldn't mint coin. Could not do that. Uh, except Massachusetts. Massachusetts was like, hey, like California was to that. You know, you know surf's up, I could do whatever I want. <laughs> And what they, what they did was they, their local legislature said, let's set up a mint. So in 1650, they set a mint up. They, 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 they uh, minted all of their silver coins uh, for about 30 years. And what they did was they started minting in 18, uh, 1652. Every time they minted their coins, they never changed the date on the coin. It was 1652 for 30 years. So when, uh, you know, alas, in, in, in England, they said, you can't do that. we got to stop. Well, we've only been doing it for one year. <laughs> and of course, they stopped making the coins at that point in time because it was illegal, but they did it for 30 years. I'll tell you, the ingenuity of these folks were unbelievable. All right, the, these, are, these are coins of Great Britain, which I, I hope you may have a chance to look at. A lot of them are silver, uh, and, and there are two or three I just want to point out. Uh, the, the silver, uh, okay, no, the Woods Hibernia. The Woods Hibernia is a coin that was minted for Ireland. And, and once they minted it and they shipped it over to Ireland, Ireland looked at it and went, send it back. We don't want anything to do with it. So they wanted to do with all these Hibernia, Woods Hibernia coins. Well, okay, guess what? They shipped them over here, and we, we accepted them because we really need that coinage for a small change. And the other one is the uh, 1773 Virginia half penny. The Virginians wanted to, the, the, uh, uh, they, they, needed, they needed a coin uh, to make change. You know, they, there was no coinage. I think that the problems to solve, we need coinage. That's the problem we had. The governments, local governments, we need money. We can't get the money because they're basically uh, no money for them to give us. And we'll cover, cover commodity money very shortly. Um, so they finally, in 1775, minted this coin for Virginia. The coin came to Virginia and the revolution started. So when all the money was passed out to the people of Virginia, guess what they did? They hoarded the money. So that never went into circulation. So that was that was a, that was a problem uh, with all of the uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, English coins and, and any other coins that were here. Now the Spain, Spanish people they came over and they 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 basically didn't colonize. I think what they did was they took the natives and they, and they enslaved them. Uh, you know, when you colonize something, you bring you want value back to the motherland. You want the, the, the people to come over from the motherland to work the, the, the plantations, the farms. Not the Spanish. They came in. They took all of Mexico, uh, Central America, Peru. Uh, they took, uh, I think it was Bolivia. Uh, they took, uh, they were in California, Texas, and Florida. Well, they started 
minting coins because they, they, <coughs> they found gold mines and silver mines that just never ended and they were, they were exploring constantly. Uh, they knew too that when they were minting coins, they had to have this consistency of weight and percent silver in each coin. Otherwise, they couldn't use it as a trading coin. Well, early on, the, the quality of some of their coins weren't very good. Uh, so this is the first documentation of quality control measures I've ever seen anywhere. What they did, supervisors executed 50 of the lines. And everyone got the memo, and everybody said, I think we got the word. <laughs> and and, and also from that point on, there was never a problem in the quality of the coins that were minted. Now, the thing that I wanted to, to show you is uh, in this, with the Spanish coins, uh, the They, they had two myths that really produced a tremendous amount of coinage, and that was Mexico City and Potosi in Bolivia. Uh, Potosi was right next to a mountain called Cerro Rico, which means rich mountain. And in that, in that one, uh, one mint, they minted $200 million worth of silver coins through about 1815 or so. I don't remember the exact date, but it was over this period of time. It was got to the point where 50% of all the silver in the world came from these 11 mints that were in these, in these, in these borders, uh, which is absolutely outstanding. And the quality of, of the coins were, were unbelievably good, uh, ever since that quality control measure was put in place. Uh, what they did was, th this is what's called a cob. They call it a, a, a cabo de bar. That means at the end of the bar. And at the end of the bar, what they would do is they would slice off a piece of silver. They would weigh it. They would file it down to, so that it met the specifications. And then they would take a, a, a die, a hand, hand die, throw them, hammer one side, hammer the other side, and they had the coin that basically held its value. Now, what they did elsewhere, which is kind of like counterfeiting, is they would take these coins, because they were so irregular in shape, they would file them down. They would keep filing the corners down, they could get another one, file the corners down, and then they would basically uh, have enough silver to make their own coins, additional coins. So this was, until 1732, uh, they dropped the car, Although these were easy to ship to Spain when they could melt them down and make, make their own coins in Spain, which were mill dollars, which I'll explain in a moment what that is. But this was, this was the coin of choice. This was the Spanish mill dollar. The Spanish mill dollar had ridges on the edge so that you could detect filing at any time. And the poor merchant, as you see, this merchant is weighing everything because they had to, because of the filing, the rubbing, the clipping, you know, you know what else. All the coins that I've collected, uh, I weigh them myself, and, and I have an electronic weigher. I don't do this, you know, with the, with the uh, bars. <laughs> and anyways, between three to about 20% is lost in weight by normal circulation. So this was, this was the, the, the uh, Spanish dollar. And this was the 50 cent piece. They would cut it in half. They said, okay, this is now 50 cents. Yeah, but we, it's a quarter. You want a quarter? Well, here's a quarter. <laughs> you know, so this is not interesting. So, so basically, they, they would cut all of these, these coins, and it would be perfect for trade. But the Spanish dollar looked like a pizza pie. Okay. This is these are all one eighths. One eighth, one eighth, one eighth. So this is a this is a half a dollar. This is a quarter of a dollar, which is and they call all of these bits. They're eight bits. So a quarter of a dollar or twenty-five cents was two bits. And that's where this came from to this day, two bits, you know, it's 
is really great. At least in my opinion. I don't know about kids. <laughs> Today, you know, two bits is nothing to me. <laughs> but anyway, so and then, then what they would do, they would cut these bits in half, and now and now this is like this is like 12 and a half cents, 12 and a half cents. Now this is 12 and a half cents divided, divided by two. And then they would do it again, so they go from one eighth to one sixteenth to one thirty seconds. And until the coinage came out with coins that represented that, and you'll see that in the Spanish coins, because what they what they did is they 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 had uh, eight reales, which was the well they call this a reales, so you can memorize that. And eight reales is a full Spanish dollar. Then they had four reales, which was a half a dollar. Then they had a two reales, but real coins. I mean, they were they were basically round coins. They weren't pieces of coins that were cut up. And then then they had uh, the, the eight reales was was uh, really the silver dollar that was going to become our own silver dollar. A lot of the coins, the Spanish coins, were basically coins here. Uh, that we we actually copied. I mean, Thomas Jefferson was a, was a, a real person that went to the decimal system, uh, with, and, and he said, "We're going to make this dollar a hundred cents." Uh, and you know, oh gosh. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so that's that's it. A lot of these coins too. You see, there's like a, a hole in there. But that was a hole. There's a plug. A lot of these islands, for example. You would basically cut through, uh, and, and so this way the coin wouldn't go to another island. It would stay at that island because a lot of that silver was cut out of it. So when they now had to use it to trade and send it away, they would replug it with silver to get the right weight so that they could get the full value of the coin, which I think is, is pretty interesting. But that was a practice that was done for quite a, quite a bit, you know, many years and many years. How did they need, they needed to acquire more coins. The only way they could do that was basically through the trading process, the maritime commerce. In 1631, the first ship went out of Boston to the West Indies. And basically, uh, what they were looking to trade was uh, cured pork, grain, salted fish, lumber, more sugar, molasses, rum, indigo, cotton, wine, and silver. This is one way that they could bring in silver to the colonies was through trade. Uh, by 1676, there were 730 ships that were on the high seas, which was quite a bit. Uh, we built some great ships, great cargo ships, and through the Spanish trade, we managed to get uh, a lot of coins back. Uh, uh, we're going to go through some very quickly. Okay, this, this is a... Uh, Kind of put them together. And what this basically shows is that, <laughs> that Windows is one heck of a swap. <laughs> <laughs> Money values. What you see, don't look at all the numbers. You just you see what says pound sterling? Mm -hmm. Pound sterling is when the British came down in about 1640 and said the Spanish dollar, because it's so uh, so much in, in, in really neat here in, in the colonies. And by the way, they wanted all the Spanish dollars they could get because they, they, they needed their own currency. It's got to be worth, the value of a Spanish real dollar has to be worth four shillings, six pounds, or six pence. That's equivalent to the next line, 54 pence. And from that, through arithmetical calculations, the really important lines are the last three lines. The, 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 English pound is worth four dollars and forty-four cents. The shilling was worth twenty-two point two cents, and the penny, the pence, was worth one point eight five cents. Now, New York and the rest of the colony said, "Well, hey, if I raise the value of that of that uh, Spanish mill dollar, instead of fifty-four pence, I made it ninety-six pence." That would draw into our colony more silver. Made sense. 
The Europeans did it for centuries. That's how they acquired more coinage. And then you had the other state, other colonies following suit, but none at eight shillings. Here you had New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware at, at 90 pence. And New Hampshire, the, the New England colonies, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Virginia somehow fit in there at six shillings. And Georgia and, and uh, South Carolina, four shillings, eight pence. Well, New York and, and uh, North Carolina was the most. So that, you know, so you want to calculate how much is it worth, you know, just take from that table, basically, what those values are, and you come down to the dollar and cent figure, and then just come forward and rate inflation for 300 years and you see what the current value is today. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I, 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 I don't need to go through this very fast. I've got another 10 minutes. We're going to have to, uh, uh, I'm just going to do one of these and then we're going to go forward. Okay, time, every time uh, they could, they would put in the local newspaper, this is Pennsylvania, advertisement, if you will, on coinage. Uh, basically, this is saying, here's what the value is of all of these coins, and this is what the least weight has to be for that coin to have that value. Mm -hmm. Now, look at all these different coins. I can't even pronounce them, let alone say you know, where they're from and how much are they value, and how do you work that into a, a marketing system? Very, very hard. Uh, but here's the Spanish mill dollar, okay? It's the eight reales, eight the uh, Eight real is seven six, which is was on that chart. Uh, that was seven shillings six pence is what it's worth. And it has to weigh seventeen penny weights six grains. Anything under that, you deduct a certain amount of money from the value. Uh, and I, I, I kind of found that to be interesting. Uh, one ounce shilling sil of sterling of silver was five shillings two pence. At that point in time, remember I said before they were selling, the only was selling s silver to the Europeans, the money changers, I think they were the Madoff uh, crew, <laughs> that they were getting five knot instead of five two. And that's like 11% profit just for doing nothing. It's called an arbitrage today. So they were arbitraging even in those days. Mm -hmm. Nothing new. Nothing new. And here's something that I just wanted to touch on. This, this is a 17. 92 chart that was in the papers. And what, what, what they're looking at here is uh, we're now going to tell you what all these are worth New York and Delaware and Maryland, Georgia, but here's what it is in our currency. This is federal values. The first time I saw a federal value saying, stop already with all this stuff over here. Let's take these coins, and this is what the value is in dollars and cents. Okay, dollars, cents, dimes, cents, and mills. I've never seen mills anywhere. And these are eagles, these are gold coins. So this is the first time that uh, I've ever seen anything like that. Uh, so barter, uh, okay, I think we'll open it up to, uh, to, to questions, whatever, or continue on a little bit. But yes, sir. Can we hear of the ice cream dime? An ice cream dime, what's that? No, it's, uh, I, I don't know what year, but when you could um, make coins for like a birthday party, the, the mint. Uh -huh. uh, a gentleman bought a, uh, 10 of them and gave them to his kids. And one of them was uh, bought an ice cream with it, and it so fed into the public, became a... Uh, became a counterfeit? No, it, be, it became a uh, valuable coin because oh, it was uh, one of the only ones that's still around. Because it's worn, you know, it's circulated. Okay. They call it an ice cream dime because the That's kids want an ice cream with it instead of saving it. Right. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm in charge of the custom house in Safe Harbor. Oh, great. And I always talk about how the ships came from different countries and they would, you know, then they would, the ships would take the, the money that was collected at the custom, I mean, the, the custom house money would go by package ship to New York because that was the capital right. then. Right. But I never really, and I thought, oh my goodness, it must be so confusing for them with all these coins, but I can see now they were used to all this. They were used to yeah. that. It was like us using nickels, dimes, and coins. Yeah. And, and it's really amazing that, that they could do that because, it's, it, in my opinion, it's, uh, I would have been awfully confused. For a long, I'm still confused, but I'll try to get over it. Uh, okay, Barter, we all know the phone. Yes? How did you acquire these uh, coins? Uh, through Is it auctions. Difficult? Uh, Is it difficult? They, were, they really weren't difficult. It was the auctions. Um, I dealt with a dealer in Merrick for a good number of years, and they have foreign coins that the list goes on forever, as well as U.S. coins, stamps, and the whole thing. 
So they run an auction once a month. I put in a bid, and, and sometimes I win, sometimes I don't. So that, that's how I keep it quiet. But, so, but barter, we all know barter, right? You, you know, you, 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 the problem with barter is, when I want to trade you, mine's worth more than yours. For the most, so what else are you going to give me? You know, I mean, it was like, uh, it was a merchant's nightmare. Couldn't, couldn't handle it. So basically, they overcame that uh, by doing basically uh, trading agricultural goods. I could trade you a bushel of peas for a bushel of corn, I mean, that kind of thing. But here's, here's the thing that really is unbelievable. This is wampum. Now, this is, this is a friendship belt made by a Cayuga uh, descendant uh, up in Ontario, Canada. This is glass. It's not, not the real wampum. This is real wampum for $5,000, and uh, my, my budget doesn't call for that. So, but this recorded basically all the, the treaties that they had with the British, French, and Dutch, mm -hmm. as well as the colonials, uh, for friendship and peace. And I find it to be a very pretty uh, wampum belt. Basically, uh, this is real wampum, uh, which you'll see later uh, if you want to. Uh, it's a lot different than this glass wampum. Uh, this six white was equal to a penny. Three blue or purple was equal to a penny. So you saw this, this uh, value system starting to take shape. Uh, the Dutch basically wanted uh, the trade, in, especially up in Albany, they wanted the trade in the, the beaver pelts, uh, the, the, the skins of the different animals so they could ship them back to, to, to England. So they made beaver hats, by the way, I was talking to Tom before. The beaver hats were worth a lot of money and show your wealth. Like today, or not today, but maybe 30 years ago, one wore this uh, mink coat, you know, that was a sign of wealth. Uh, beaver hats were a sign of wealth. So uh, wampum was big, uh, and basically, uh, wampum was used in our purchase of Montauk. Uh, Montauk, back, I think it was 1660, uh, there was a treaty with the Montauks where they, did, they wanted to buy the, the Montauk area for 100 pounds sterling, which meant that each year they had to pay 10 pounds to the Montauk Indians. Now, they could either pay it in Indian corn at four shillings a bushel, or they could pay it in wampum at, uh, at, I think it was six cents per bean. So you either did 50 bushels of Indian corn a year, or you did 14,400 wampum beads a year, or any mixture of the two, which I, which I found very interesting. So, but what happened after a while, when towns of Huntington was captain, and uh, I think uh, one other uh, town, whenever they were purchased, one thing that was in the purchase was called the mukes, M-U-X-E. The mukes was a mechanical drill. It was the drill that all of these Indians, they, right here is, was the center of Wampum Haven. I mean, this was where they, they, they drilled for, for Wampum here like people would drill for oil. And they would produce, uh, let's say, two for every half hour. Once they got these drills, the, the production went like this. I mean, they were shipping out to Narragansett, they were shipping it upstate, they were shipping wampum all over, the Dutch took it and traded with it. And of course, what happens when you have too much of one thing? <laughs> one time. Well, instead of you know, one penny for three, you got you know, 24 pennies, uh, 20, 24 wampum for one penny. And finally, uh, by 1661, Massachusetts said, that's it, no more wampum, we're going to pay for money. Well, that was a nice switch. You know, and, and some other time we'll get into that. One of the few, two more things I'd like to just cover. Uh, the tobacco trade, well, the tobacco trade was, uh, uh, tobacco was actually the, the real currency in Virginia. Uh, 1619, it became legal tender. Uh, again, it overproduced, and again, uh, it went from maybe five shillings down to less than a penny. A pound, and that was the end of uh, uh, tobacco. And then I just want to cover some quick items. And I'm sorry, I, I, I don't want to hold you folks. We'll spend another two minutes and on these beaver skins. Okay, this is July 14, 
that's sweat sweet. Birkin butter. This is my lousy typing. Uh, I, this is sweet Birkin oh. butter. A Birkin is a tub of butter. Uh, so that's what that is, and that's uh, I'm spelling it. So here are the, here are the dry hides, tan leather, mackerel oil, whalebone, bayberry wax, turpentine, merchantable bar iron. Here's cast iron pots and kettles. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's 48. That's 48 shillings for a hundred weight. Mm -hmm. And well cured tobacco, four shilling, uh, four pence per pound, and good tri tallow, which we all needed in those days. Uh, it's eight pence a pound. So that, and and this is how they they trade it. And you know what? All of these values were put on a balance sheet. So you know, like just think of you go out and you go, you go to. Um, downtown East Hampton, and you buy a scarf, you know, and, and you pay it with a credit card. I mean, the $400 for that scarf, you know, when, you, when it shows on your bill, <laughs> that wasn't paid, it was just $400. You, eventually, it evaporated when you paid it. But here, they would put all of these values on the balance sheet, uh, on an income, not an income statement, but a balance sheet showing how much you owe. And that kind of brought them right up to the point of taking money which, which I'm going to just quickly say, we have some very nice samples of it here today. I have, in fact, some of the uh, the the, uh, the the dollars, and we have some right from the uh, collection here, the Long Island collection. Uh, these are continental dollars and Pennsylvania shillings, and we have some very fine uh, examples of uh, paper money. Uh, one that says uh, you counterfeit the dollar. <laughs> so they did say that. It never happened, I don't think. Yeah. But they, they stated that. So someday we'll, we'll get together again. We'll, we'll cover paper money. We'll cover some other items. And I'm sorry to keep you so long. It's been over an hour.